Have you ever been faced with a situation that defies all the remedies your mind can think of? Do you remember how helpless and hopeless you felt in that situation when it seemed the challenge was going to linger and persist until it took your peace or your life? There's nothing scarier than facing a problem without an idea of how to navigate your way around it. And you see yourself resigning to fate and hoping on that challenge or problem to either run its course or solve itself. The place of hopelessness in the face of a problem becomes more dangerous than the problem because you do not have the solution for it. You go through the newspapers and tabloids nowadays and you realize quickly that the world is tipped on the edge of commotion. More problems keep rearing their heads in a world where solutions are not as forthcoming as the rate at which these challenges and evils keep rising. I remember growing up in a Bible-believing Christian home. The very first thing my mother taught me early in life was the fact that the God that we serve does not recognize limitations. My mother taught me that with God, all things are possible. Every time my mother had to teach us about how trusting in God takes care of the impossibilities in our lives, she always read a Bible passage to us. Mark 9.23 If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Did you notice where the passage says, if you can? There are many things in the world that are impossible for a man and natural means, but that is not the end of the story. With God, all things are possible because God's power is unlimited. The best time in the life of any child of God is that time when you realize that your affairs are being run by a God who carries the power to change impossible situations into victory. God is not limited by any chance, but we have limited ourselves because of our unbelief. In the Bible passage that we just read from the book of Mark, Jesus said to the people that everything is possible for one who believes. Your unlimited belief in God removes the barrier that blocks His way from stepping into situations. Two cannot walk together unless there is an agreement. That agreement translates into trust, and trust fosters growth in a relationship. If you can believe in God that He possesses the ability to totally reverse a solution-defying situation, the power of your convictions and your trust is the catalyst for your speedy answers and access to help that you need at the material time. Having to trust God in critical situations is easier said than done. Hope in the face of extremities is the farthest level of strength your mind can imagine. Trusting God for the impossible or in the impossible means you have to keep yourself steady and keep your mind trained on God's ability instead of looking at the situation. Trusting God requires your whole attention focused on all the impossible things He has done and how He did them. Have you ever come across the story of the Israelites before the Red Sea? Have you read the accounts of how Moses led them out of the land of Egypt? The story is full of mysterious and impossible acts of God. The journey of the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land remains one of the finest deeds of God. So many impossible situations they faced on their way, and each time, God was right on hand to do something greater. Listen to me, child of God. When the situation looks impossible, that is the setup for God to move, if only your trust is only in God. Faced with a Red Sea, and chased by the Pharaoh and his army, it looked like a scene prepared for the end of their lives. But in the book of Exodus 14.13, But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Your utterances in the face of tribulation communicate not just your words, but your faith and trust in God. When your heart fails you in the face of your problems, your faith in God is non-existent, and without faith in God, you will never see His hand in your affairs. Just like Moses stood and declared the children of Israel before that Red Sea, I say to you, child of God, look up. Look at those problems and challenges that seem impossible that have defied all solutions proffered so far. 
that have stood as a stumbling block over the years and begin to speak their end through God. Many times, I find that I am in a constant battle between my own will to begin to do everything humanly possible until I reach the end of my humanity. I have gone through unnecessary pains and agonies, nights of toil and prayers. I have suffered unnecessary injuries to my life and worth many times because I gave in to my human instincts. And when I hit the limit of my trials, I succumb to the hopelessness and the struggle becomes part of me. But I found a Bible passage while scrolling through a journal online and the words of that passage became the light to my path. I found peace, joy, contentment, and most importantly, ease in dealing with my daily struggles. Isaiah 23, 6, You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. I found peace trusting in God, and that peace translated into God becoming my rock. Listen, those things you feel are impossible today. If you try, no matter how little your faith is, if you try to hand that situation and your whole operation over to God, you will find ease, George Mueller once said. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Where your imagination ends is the beginning of the thought of God. The only path to true living in dominance over your life's toughest battles is trust in God. God does not glory in your defeat, neither does heaven derive joy from our sufferings. But we have limited ourselves to our human abilities, thereby shutting the access through which unsolvable problems are resolved. God. Jesus, one day, was teaching in the mountains for days, and a group of his followers gathered around him in their thousands to listen to him. The more Jesus spoke, the more people gathered, and this was a normal characteristic of the ministry of our Lord while on earth. But one day, Jesus looked up after many hours of teaching, and he saw that the people needed to be fed. Remember that these were not just his twelve disciples and the few followers he went about with. This was a crowd of over five thousand people. Due to the crowd, Jesus had retreated into a more secluded area away from the town, and the people followed in thousands, and now he wanted to feed them. I can imagine how confused the disciples were when Jesus told them to instruct the people to sit down and get ready to be fed. They knew that no arrangements for food or welfare had been made beforehand. They are aware that the coffers had no money, and even if they did, they knew how difficult it was going to be to get enough food that would feed a crowd that was the size of a small city in their days. I can imagine many of the disciples were whispering amongst themselves how the master wanted to achieve this feat. The only things they had as food for the whole crowd were five loaves of bread and two fish. That food was only enough for five men, and Jesus intended to feed over 5,000 people with it. This was a completely impossible situation for a human man. There's no possible calculation in the human frame of mind that can feed over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. But in the book of Matthew 14, 18, Jesus said to them, Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces that were left over. What is that situation that looks like it cannot happen? What do people say to you about that plan of yours, about how impossible your health challenges are? What do people tell you about your financial situation? What does your mind say about your own battles? Consider Jesus Christ. His mindset was never set on the situation on the ground. The available resources or the unavailability of them were not his concern. His mind and his faith were trained and steady on the ability and the possibility of his intentions. He lifted his eyes to heaven and gave thanks. 
He didn't ask heaven for the miracle to increase the bread and fish. His faith and trust in the ability of God to do that already handled the impossible situation before it even occurred. When you see a man or woman around you enjoying the level of ease and comfort, check very well that that man or woman is totally sold to the idea that nothing is impossible with God. Child of God, do not look at the challenge. Do not train your mind to look at the complexities in the situation instead. Train your mind to trust God that before any problems arise, He is capable. That is the secret to living in victorious bliss in life and destiny. Put your trust in the God of the impossible. Jesus Christ, while He was on earth doing His ministry, had to use many means of transportation to move around sharing His gospel, and one of such was a boat ride across rivers and seas. On one such trip, Jesus was so tired that he went into the main bowl of the ship they were on to catch a little sleep. And while he slept, the ship ran into turbulence at sea. The situation became an emergency. The storm was so fierce that the disciples began to panic because evidently the ship was about to sink. They were toiling and trying to maneuver the ship away from the storm when they realized Jesus had been asleep all this time. In the middle of the sea, caught in a storm, the ship at the edge of sinking, the whole crew and disciples were scared out of their wits, trying to save the boat and themselves. And here was Master Jesus sleeping peacefully and undisturbed in the same ship. The situation looked like the end until the disciples went to his side and woke him up. The Bible records in the book of Mark 4.39, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Who you look up to determines much of what you receive. The disciples knew that they had Jesus on the boat. They were aware that they had a solution on the boat, but that solution was not available to them until they stopped applying their human abilities and cried out for Jesus instead. As a child of God, the only limitation to your success in difficult and impossible situations is your trust in God. Make a decision today to leave all your affairs to God. Put your total trust in Him and enter into a life of victorious existence and ease. Community is very important to your advancement. But do you know that telling everyone what you're up to might be a very bad idea? We are in an era of so much information, both personal and general. Before the social media age, you couldn't see so much about many people. Everyone looked serious and smart. People appreciated the mystery of our individuality and the beauty of unveiling that comes with it. However, this is hardly the case today. Although there still is discreetness among people, the majority of us have been revealed to be too open about our lives. Nowadays, you can literally tell a person's routine by what they share online, from the food they have for breakfast to what their closet looks like, from the people they hang out with to their plans for life, outlined step by step. This may be helpful sometimes, as it gives us the opportunity to be expressive. However, it's not wise to disclose your life to the world. Besides the danger of sharing your information with the wrong crowd, you could give the devil room to use others against you in one way or another. Now, I'm not attacking social media. It's helped us in so many ways. However, I want to share a counsel with you that I believe God wants you to have for your own safety and well-being on earth as His child. I really want you to look to Jesus as your perfect example. After all, the Bible says you should. We all should. 1 John 2.6 says, The one who says he belongs to Christ should live the same kind of life Christ lived. What was Jesus like? How did Jesus live his life? If Jesus was here on earth today, 
how would he use social media? I can't perfectly answer this, but since Jesus is a person of his words, then we could use the things he said to measure what he would have done and how he would have lived his life on earth. You may be asking, what exactly did Jesus say about this issue? I'll show you in a moment. You see, when you listen to someone talk and you watch and see how their lives conform to what they say, you know you can describe them by their words. When Jesus walked the earth, his life followed a pattern, and we as followers of Christ ought to follow the same pattern. One day, a leader called Nicodemus approached him and asked about his person. He wanted to know about Jesus and what made him so special. He also wanted to know how he could share in the uniqueness of Christ. When Jesus replied that he first had to be born again, Nicodemus was even more confused. He couldn't understand rebirth in the sense that Jesus meant. However, Jesus, being the patient teacher, sat him down and began to explain. He revealed to him that being born again was a spiritual event, not a physical one. However, through a spiritual event, being born again would affect and influence the physical life of the person in question. This would be the outcome of the inner working of the Holy Spirit within the individual. In the third verse of that conversation in John chapter 3, Jesus said something I want us to see. John 3, 8 The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear its sound. You do not know where it comes from or where it goes. It is the same with everyone who is born of the Spirit of God. Why do you think Jesus made this statement? And how does it serve as a statement to help you guard against telling everyone what you're up to? You see, the life of the typical Pharisee in the days of Jesus was quite similar to what we have today. They were literally very public people. Jesus condemned that because it only revealed their hypocrisy and desire for attention and recognition. Matthew 23, 5-7 Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Does this sound familiar? I think you agree. You may not notice this in others or even in your own life. The life of the Pharisee is a contrast to the life of the Spirit that Jesus says is responsible for our new birth. Don't get me wrong, it's good to have people you can share special moments with as well as strategic plans. They may be able to help you as God gives them the capacity to do so. However, you must remember first of all that as God's child, you must be led by the Spirit of God within you about the kinds of plans you share with people and the kinds of people you share them with. You must never tell people everything in your life or your next plan of action. Jesus literally said you're to be like the wind, be unpredictable. I've seen many believers fall into snares because of their predictability. People literally plan how to bring them down, calculate the response to things, and successfully make them stumble. This should not be so for you, my friend. Paul's words in Romans 8.14 echo the words of Jesus again for us to hear. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit of God? It means to be under His Lordship. It means that you have submitted your mind, body, spirit, and soul to Him. It means that even when you want to speak, His influence over you keeps you from opening your mouth. You may not know this, but apart from exposing yourself too much to everyone, telling anyone your next move or what you're up to may give someone a weapon to use against you. Develop the habit of sharing only when you're done with what you're doing. Sometimes, people would gather, thinking Jesus would be in a particular place because they saw him there before, but they didn't find him. It would take a while before someone would say they saw him somewhere else. Why do you think Jesus was like the wind and unpredictable like he says all spirit-born believers should be? You'll find the answer here, John 2, 24-25. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. 
Can you see it? You may also be wondering, what exactly is in man? What makes it an issue to entrust yourself to people? God himself answered that question explicitly in Genesis 6-5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. When people are yet to submit their heart to the Lordship of Jesus, they may not even know this, but it would be dangerous to entrust yourself to them. Like those born of the Spirit, those under the power of Satan can also be unpredictable. They may win your confidence by laughing with you today. But what if Satan intends to instigate an evil plot against you? What if deep within them, they just want to know what you're up to so that they can find a way to sabotage everything? Don't forget that the Bible warns us against the heart of the unsaved and ungodly men in Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. So if God the Creator confirms that the heart of man towards other men is evil, who are we to invalidate that? This is sad but true. Many believers fall into this category. Why? Because they have yet to truly surrender their hearts to the Spirit to work on them. So they could smile at you at church and ask a lot of questions about you. And because you consider them family, you tell them. Unknown to you, they are about to take what you said and work something against you. They would do this for the same reasons the unsaved person would. Fear, jealousy, pride, or just disdain for another person's success. These are all the works of the flesh and shouldn't be named among us as children of God. But since you can't literally see into everyone's heart, it's safer for you to keep your mouth shut and your plans to yourself. If you must share your plans, do so with individuals who God has laid on your heart to trust. Do so with people whom, like Jesus, you've watched and seen live spiritual lives, yielding to the Spirit more than the flesh. Share with people whose love for you has been proven. Don't share with the person who probably still throws a few punches from time to time, when they could easily turn the other cheek like Jesus said. Don't share with the individual who encourages sinful lifestyles in the name of being woke or politically correct. Don't share with the person who's continued to show signs of desperation to make a profit at almost every opportunity. You know why? Because he or she can easily sell you out without blinking if need be. You are a child of the Spirit, my friend. It's time we believers go back to the basics and sit at the feet of the Lord and ask Him to teach us to live like the pilgrims we are on earth. The Lord has promised to be with you always until the end of time. So there is no reason to fear what anyone can do to you. If God is for you, can anyone really fight you and win? However, since the same scripture also says wisdom is profitable in directing your path, you must be wise about whom you share your next or current move with. May God guide you by His Spirit and keep you safe from the eyes of the wicked and ungodly folks sent to bring you down. Everything will fall into place for you when you stand strong in the Lord. It doesn't matter how long it takes. As long as you are standing where God wants you to be, you are in the right position for your blessing. There is a very interesting story in chapter 35 of the book of Jeremiah. The story is of the family clan called the Rechabites. The end of that chapter recorded God releasing an eternal blessing on that clan because of their resolve for obedience at a time of serious difficulty and perversion in all of Israel. How did they receive this recognition and blessing from the Almighty Himself? Their father had passed down an instruction to them that as long as they lived, Generation after generation, they were to abstain from drinking wine, building houses, and owning vineyards. They were to live in tents and trust God in their provisions as they served Him with their lives. This instruction became a tradition that each Rechabite took upon his or herself to follow. 
They passed it down across their lineage, parents to their children. Then one day God sent his servant Jeremiah to test their obedience by giving them a large quantity of wine to drink as a gift from the man of God. However, this clan refused to accept it. They reminded the man of God of their father's instruction and how it had become their tradition. This impressed God so much that he used them as an example to all of Israel. He spoke through Jeremiah and told the Israelites how even though they had turned a deaf ear to his warnings and calls to repentance, there were still people who put it on themselves to keep the instructions of their fathers, even if the whole nation were going astray. And because of their faithfulness, God gave them the eternal promise of continuity. Jeremiah chapter 35 verses 13 through 14 and verses 18 through 19 say, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, Go and tell the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, Will you not learn a lesson and obey my words, declares the Lord. Jehonadab, son of Rechab, ordered his descendants not to drink wine, and his command has been kept. To this day, they do not drink wine, because they obey their forefather's command. But I have spoken to you again and again, yet you have not obeyed me. Then Jeremiah said to the family of the Rechabites, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, you have obeyed the command of your forefather, Jehonadab, and have followed all his instructions and have done everything he ordered. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, will never fail to have a descendant to serve me. Why is this blessing so important? How is having continuity in service to God a significant blessing? The reason is this, Job chapter 36, verse 11. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. As long as there is someone to serve God, there will be someone to reward and bless. As long as each generation is graced by God to serve him, that generation will steadily enjoy the blessing of God as a reward for their service. So. God was indirectly saying that his clan will never lack a reason to be blessed as long as they live on the earth in service to him. This is a legacy worth emulating, dear friend. Many times we may wonder why we miss certain chances and lose certain promised blessings. The answer is simple. More often than not, many of us do not stand strong in the Lord long enough. These men and women of the Rechabite family never gave in to the pressures of their time not the pressure from the nation itself, their communities, or even the great man of God, Jeremiah. Was Jeremiah honestly trying to make them fail? No, he was simply obeying God's instruction. You may ask, was God then trying to make them fail? The answer is still no. The Bible tells us that God does not tempt people with the expectation of causing them to fall. Rather, he confirms our convictions just like he did with Father Abraham. You know, the Lord knows all things. He sees and knows our hearts. However, one of the reasons he takes measures to confirm our convictions is to show us our own hearts. You see, you cannot really say you're strong if you have never had your strength tested by anything. Imagine one who has never sat for an exam or taken any kind of test but claims to be super intelligent. We will question that. Why? because there is no proof or track record of him or her having ever passed any exam or test. You see, the exam or test is not to make any student fail. No teacher wants that. No teacher wants to retain his or her pupils over and over in the same class. The joy of the teacher is to learn that all of his or her students are excelling. The tests and exams are to prove that the student has truly learned what was taught. You see, God is just not our father. He is also our teacher and coach. In his heart, I believe God believed that the Rechabites would pass the test. He was sending Jeremiah to give them. The plan was to use that test as a lesson for the whole nation of Israel. He believed in them and they didn't fail him. This reminds me of the words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 that say, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 
like the Rechabites, every child of God like you is faced with intense pressure on every side, especially in our generation today. Almost everything being put out there calls us to take a step outside God. Everything is asking you to lie, cheat, make someone else fall, hurt others, take advantage of their ignorance, do what your flesh wants, or sin against God. The list is too numerous to mention. Never has there been such need for believers to stand strong as there is today. In a moment, I will tell you what it means to stand strong, but I need you to know that God has the best plans for you. Like the Rechabites, He intends to make you an example, a legacy for others to follow. Remember that He calls you the light and salt of the earth. He intends to use your story and experiences as a testimony to point men to Jesus. Your commitment to God is not simply an adherence to His words, but also an opportunity for God to brag on you and reward you for your diligence. And you know that when God rewards, He leaves no stone unturned. The Bible tells us that He never forgets our labor of love. He counts it unfaithfulness to forget our service. Therefore, whatever you need will fall into place in His time. Your job is to stand strong in Him. Make sure you're not one step in and one step out, but fully standing in the Lord. The Bible tells us to be strong, not in ourselves, not in our intelligence, not in our friends or family, not in our possessions, but to be strong only in the Lord. When you are strong in the Lord, He will empower you for other areas like He did the Rechabites. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. At the end of the day, the difference between those who ran this race and those who didn't at all will be who makes it to the end. Like you and I, many people run this race of faith. Whether in ministry, in business, in marriage, in whatever area, they try to trust God for the best outcome and all of that. However, in the face of opposition or intense pressure, many give up and turn to the solutions of this world. They give up seeking after God. They give up trusting and depending on Him. Instead, they take up excuses and options in the world that cost them their faith and time meant for God. For such a person, they have already stopped running the race. The distractions have cut their journey short, and now they are doing something else. May this not be your portion in Jesus' name. To be strong in the Lord means to keep deriving your strength from Him. To be strong in the Lord means to make God your only option. Yes, there will be options in the world from family, friends, colleagues, and organizations. Some of them would even appear good. However, they will not align with God's plan for your life. For example, the Rechabites needed to be a people who abstained from wine and having many possessions. They were to live a simple life. That was their calling, their commitment to God, and they were faithful to it. They followed God through that roadmap, and God acknowledged them. We all have different callings, but when it comes to standing in God, it is the same thing. It is the work of faith. Your resolve may fail you, have you ever resolved to do something and failed? Have you ever promised yourself that you do something at one time and when the time came, you found yourself doing something else? There's no guarantee that your resolve will happen in one day or all at once. It may take time. Friends are great gifts, family and colleagues likewise. However, to be strong in them is to put yourself at the mercy of their disappointment because you see, anyone born of a woman on the earth has the capability of failing you. Yet, there is one who cannot fail and will never fail those who make him their strength. David called him my rock and my salvation. Psalms chapter 62 verse 2 says, Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. What miracle are you trusting God for in your life? Are you hoping for certain things to happen or change? Then check and see where you are standing whether in the Lord or out of Him. If you are standing in the Lord, make sure your stand is strong and not unstable, not double-minded, doubtful of fear, but with wholehearted resolve. Why is this important? It is important because when you stand in a position to receive something from God, that is the position God wants to meet you. When He comes and you're not there, you would have missed your miracle. This is what's happening to many saints today. 
You've labored in faith for so long, and at the last minute, you kept quitting because you felt God wasn't doing anything. Then after a while, when you look back, you saw that everyone who passed through the same situation or position that you had were always blessed. What happened? Most of those people are coming to reap the harvest you sowed, but because you couldn't stand long enough to receive it, you left it, and now it's theirs. You see, the blessings or fulfillment of God's promise does not return to Him after being sent. Rather, it will stay here until it is used. So if it's wealth, for example, the business you gave up on and sold may become a global phenomenon tomorrow. The question still remaining is this, are you standing strong in the Lord? Everything you need, the right things for you, will definitely fall into place if you keep standing strong in God. When was the last time you prayed? When was the last time you stayed with God's word in meditation and prayer? When last did you remind yourself that you won't give up on God despite the pressures around you, but you'll keep seeking and serving Him? Be strong, my friend. Though your weeping may endure for the night, your joy is definitely going to come in the morning. If you are feeling weak and like you have no more strength to hang in there, ask the Lord for strength. The Bible says that He is the source of strength to the weak, and He increases strength for those getting weary. Keep standing strong, my friend. It's about to change for your good. The Bible says, draw closer to God and He will draw closer to you. James 4, 8. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Have you read those lines before? What does it mean to draw closer or nearer to God? Maybe you're thinking, didn't the Bible already say that God's closer to me than I can imagine? How then can I draw close to someone that's already close to me? Yes, the Bible says so. However, in order to know how to draw closer to God, you first need to understand what it means. You won't be able to draw closer to God if you don't even know what that means. You see, understanding what it means to draw closer to God will do so much good in your Christian life. In fact, what is a Christian life apart from a close walk with God? No one should delight more in intimacy with God than the Christian should. After all, the Bible does say that we are now one with God in the Spirit through our faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6:17. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with Him in spirit. However, it's sad that many individuals can profess faith in Jesus and live the rest of their lives without knowing Him or walking with Him. This shouldn't be your ideal. God does not want you only accepting Jesus into your heart. He also wants to invite you to walk with Him. Amazingly, this is a pattern from the beginning of time. See these two examples. Enoch, Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Abraham, Genesis 17, 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. One common word in these two examples is the word walk. This is not a physically changing of steps literally. Rather, it connotes getting in step with God. Walking with God means getting into God's path, committing yourself to understanding His person, His systems, and His work. Many of us stop knowing the works of God. When the blind eyes open, we say it's God and we rejoice to His glory. When you get a raise in the office, you shout, glory to God. However, God wants us to move from there. He wants us to move closer and to know his ways, his system of operation, his thoughts, and his person. That was what Enoch had with him. And that was what he was inviting Abraham to have. 
Do you notice that when God met Abraham, their relationship was built around the promise of a son and prosperity? But after diverse encounters and development in the relationship, Abraham grew above the things and sought after the person of God, to the point that he was willing to offer up his son Isaac, if that would please God. It was at this point God spoke and said, Now I know you fear me. Genesis 22:12. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. But hold on, isn't God supposed to know who fear him and who doesn't? Does he know all things already? We may never know the complete or perfect answer to that. However, I can boldly say this, God wasn't speaking because he didn't know. He was speaking because Abraham had proved something that was only just within his heart before now. You see, it's one thing to say you love someone. It's another thing to demonstrate that love. Abraham had just demonstrated his love and fear of God through his sacrifice of Isaac. I'm sure you're beginning to grasp what I'm trying to say. There are certain experiences and privileges that are reserved only for those who seek and draw closer to God. Those who are comfortable with God's hand never see his face. Psalms 103, 7. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. And you know the danger here? People who are too used to only the work of God are easily deceived by the devil's work. They do not know that the enemy can also make his own copies of God's work in such a way that unless you truly know God in spirit and truth, you would buy his idea. No wonder the Bible says he's disguised as an angel of light. Jesus also warned about the last day's deception and how so many people would fall for it. Matthew 24, 24 to 25. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. My point is, drawing closer to God is as important as running your Christian race without falling by the wayside and getting lost again. God loves you so much, and this is why he's preparing you with these truths, to keep you from falling and to sustain you until the end. Make sure to pay attention and take advantage of them. Let us look back on our opening verse of the book of James, and let us see the preceding verses leading up to our opening scripture to give us a better understanding of what it means to draw closer to God. James 4, 6-8 But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Observe those words. He talks about God's supply of grace to the proud. He then talks about submitting yourself through that grace to God. And resist the devil for him to flee you. He ends by saying to make sure you come near to God so he can come near to you. Keep your hands clean from sin and your hearts pure from doubt. How does this help you understand what it means to get closer to God? Here's how. Just like Enoch, Abraham, David, Moses, and the whole lot of them that had wonderful relationships with God during their earthly journey. Drawing closer to God means aligning yourself with him. Not only to know him more, but to understand, love, and serve him with your whole life. Someone may be thinking, but how can one do that? Is it even possible? Yes, it can be done. And yes, it is possible. Remember, the Bible tells us that those who will do exploits in the last days would be those who know their God. And listen, they won't know him from a distance. They would know him through close walk with him. They would know his person, his systems, precepts, his will and his work, because they are closer to him. If you're struggling to know the will of God for your life, know that you will need to draw closer to him. 
If you do draw closer to God, you would know His desires and you will easily bring them forth in your own life. So instead of praying, Lord, show me your will, you can also pray, Lord, draw me closer to you. Having seen what drawing closer to God means, let us now see how you can draw closer to God, how you can get in His path, get in step with Him, and bring forth His purpose in your life through your intimacy with Him. 1. Be born again. We can never overestimate this. No one who isn't a member of God's family can hope to come closer to God. If you wish to know God more and have Him reveal Himself to you like He did to our fathers of faith, then you must surrender your life over to Him and turn from a life of sin. It's not enough to like Jesus, Christians, or going to church. You must be saved and reborn by receiving His life into you. When you cross this line, then you have guaranteed yourself a place in heaven, as well as position yourself to partake in everything every child of God enjoys in Him. God didn't create hell for you. Whoever goes there does so of their own free choice. Don't make that mistake today. God love you is an invitation to life. Two, to get closer to God, you must be a person of prayer. Prayer is the powerhouse of every Christian. If you hardly talk with God, there's no way you'll get intimate with Him. One day after a moment of prayer, I heard these words in my spirit. There is a close connection between prayer and consecration. Those words stuck to me like glue to this day. I can't imagine a believer living a consecrated lifestyle with God's grace without an active prayer life. Getting closer and in step with God takes time and process. It's in the place of prayer that the process occurs. Don't only pray to ask for things. Pray also to ask for more God. Pray to have your heart love and yearn for Him more. If you study the life of David, it will amaze you how much God meant to him. Something in God must have touched him to make him seek God that much. You too can have that something too. Ask God to revive your prayer life today, my friend. You cannot survive without it, especially today. 3. Another way to draw closer to God is to develop the lifestyle of spending time with your Bible, the written Word of God, as well as with sound teaching that are rooted in Scripture through literature, media, and sermons. The Word of God is light and life to those who find it. God's Word has the power to change your life, but it's only as powerful as the value you place on it. That means if you place no value on it, no power will come out of it. But if you do, you make yourself a recipient of its power. Meditation. Through Christian meditation, you empty your mind to fill it with the Word of God. Listen, the more you ponder on the work, words, and thoughts of God, the more your understanding and faith will grow. You can't remain the same in your dealings with God if you make it a habit to think about Him and the things that concern Him every day. 4. Another great way to draw closer to God is to spend time with people who are passionate about Him. Associations influence actions. I like to call your associations your associates and actions. Since your life is a product of those you surround yourself with, among many other things, that means if you surround yourself with people who know God more than you, you're bound to know God more too. Imagine spending time with people who know little to nothing about God, but are blown by every wind. You will most likely become more and more like them. Don't make the mistake of underestimating the power of relationships in your walk with God. They'll either help you or draw you away. 5. Fasting is another way to draw closer to God, a very powerful one at that. You see, when you fast, you weaken your flesh, open up your spirit, and attract God to you more. This is why one of the easiest ways to seek God's counsel is through fasting. At that time, your body is weak and it succumbed to your authority. You've purified yourself and can hear God easily at that time. I'm sharing these powerful keys with you. 
Please, don't throw them away. Do you want to get into God's path? Then make sure you're in the faith in Christ Jesus. Forsake your old life of sin and surrender completely to live for God. Then, start spending time in the Word and prayer with those who know God more than you do and in fastings. In time, you'll find yourself walking in God's perfect will for your life. The harshest conditions of life produce the toughest men who have walked the earth. The most ridiculously difficult seasons of life have bred the most hardened lover of God, despite the difficulties. The cruelest places of the earth are the making ground of some of the most love-filled men on the face of the earth. The same conditions that exist in some of the darkest places of the world, that given rise to some of the most callous and difficult men on earth today, have given birth to some of the most selfless people that can exist. This is real. This is true. Sadly, in most cases, wickedness seems to outweigh good, and we see the most outrageous scenes of darkness on display than the dim glory of one good deed. God has always favored making His hard generals in the most difficult conditions possible. He has always crafted some of the most hardened, die-hard lovers of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God through these means. He knows that the only way to get the true nature of man, many times, is by passing him through the most difficult seasons of his life. This he is very much aware of. He knows. He knows that you don't know yourself as you are. You may think you know yourself right now, but the real truth is, you don't. He knows the deepest intents of man's heart. His word clearly shows this in Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 and 16. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He knows you more than your parents, your spouse, and your loved ones know you. Think of that best friend you have, that close relationship you have, that person who seems to be able to tell your every thought and motive at a glance. You see all those people. They have no clue whatsoever who you really are. They may have a very broad perspective of you, but they are clueless. No one can genuinely predict where you will be in the future, who you will become, and the kind of man you will become. No one, absolutely none. Now, if your biological siblings don't even know you, your beloved ones don't know you. Even you don't know you. Who can claim to know you or the potential that exists in you? Only the manufacturer can know every single thing about the product. Only the manufacturer can know to what extent the dormant abilities and potentials in a product have been exploited. He made you. He knows the hidden tendencies in the deepest crevices of your heart. He is aware of your flaws and faults. He knows your frailties. He knows your weaknesses. He knows clearly your strengths also. He is aware. So he knows that smooth sailing all through is not what you need. Yes, I know you are praying for all things to go your way. You are praying for success. You're praying for constant winning, never to lose, never to be at a disadvantage, never to be at a loss. You don't want to lose any beloved one. You don't want to ever taste the bitter pill of failure, let down in heartbreak. Sadly, that is not a path to growth. It is a sure path to destruction. For that path is an inclined slope that ends in peril and heartache. 
The sad truth that most humans deeply resolve to never come to accept in the deepest recess of their hearts is that we as humans never truly learn anything from success and winning. In terms of ratio, we probably only gain more in conceit and bloated sense of worth in ourselves when we have serial success. We begin to see our wins as following an upward curve that does not come down if we keep implementing strategies. Sadly, we are only set up for a great fall if we just continue on this path. There comes no learning experience, no hope for growth, no shape of increase, no space to readjust, no space to become better, no allowance to adapt to the changes to the strategy of the enemy and very little change, if any, at all, to the systems we employ to grow. In the end, all it does is serve to keep feeding our egos so the sure doom that awaits the proud and conceited soul catches up to us. In failure, there is definitely pain and hurt. Yes, in failure, there is definitely mishap and heartbreak. Yes, in disaster, there could be seemingly unrecoverable loss. Yes, but there is more than all these in failure and a crash. There are well-engraved lessons boldly inscribed on our hearts. When we fail, we do not forget. We hold on to the lessons we have encountered through bitter experiences. Experience has a very vivid way of founding deeply in our hearts lessons that we cannot forget even if we tried. A failure has no reason to be conceited. Hence, the problem with pride is handled. When such a son of God finally finds grace and rows beyond failure and hurt, he is aware that it was not due to his abilities and grace, but by the grace and favor of God his Father. This knowledge sponsors deep humility that is not faked. This humility protects such a child of God from the destructive influence of pride. Those challenges are very deliberate. They are specially crafted for your making and the glory of God. You cannot remain the same man when God desires to change you. When he decides to challenge your limits and promote you, his plan is to change you because the you of today is in no way sufficient, capable, experienced, trained, or equipped to handle the future ahead of you. My friend, your future, your abilities, your grace, and your blessings are not made for you of today. It may not seem like it now, but this is a deep truth you must come to accept so as to attempt the painful place of growth. Until you decide to brace up and embrace this process, you will never be ready for the next phase. Never. The current you of today is destructive to the future you expect. You are lethal to the glorious future God has envisioned for you in His Word. The you of today is a time bomb to ruin the blessings ahead of you if you refuse to subject yourself to the series of challenges God has prepared for you. You cannot afford to remain the same man and woman you are right now. It is way too costly to manage. Saul became another man after he encountered his own test. 1 Samuel chapter 10, 6-9 through nine. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee, and thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and shew thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. You cannot remain the same man once you encounter God. Saul was unknown in the vast lands of Israel, but he was fated to never be anything great until he was selected by God. When he was chosen, he wasn't sent like that. No, 
he was changed by the blessed anointing of the Lord upon him, making him fit for the future that was to be his reality henceforth. Saul of today could not be king of Israel. No, he had to become another man by the sure hand of God until he changed into that form, until his heart was warped into such that it could host the realities of the throne as king. He was unfit to ascend the throne of Israel. He could in no way lead any man. He was unfit to stand ahead of any man to show the way, much more the nation. Jacob was forced with a similar dilemma. He was a serial failure. He could not even marry the woman he wanted as a wife. Even in that, he was cheated. He had to labor harshly for many years to amass whatever he got out of life. He lived a difficult life. But God had planned such a glorious future for him, a future the current Jacob could never see if he remained the same man without facing the challenge of God. He knew this too and desperately desired and sought after God for a change in his status in life. The Bible paints a very vivid picture of this. Genesis 32, 24 through 30. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Jacob refused to proceed any more in this sad tale of struggle. When will you get tired to continue as you, dear child of God, and storm ahead into the challenge God has for you, that you may come out of this experience another man, properly prepared for the great tomorrow He has for you. Choose to embrace God's challenge to change you today.